Pray with me. Come, Father God. Come, Lord Jesus. Come, Holy Spirit. Open our hearts and minds to that which you would teach us this day. For it's in your holy name we pray. Amen. Well, this is where I invite the children to please come forward, and they're not here today. Or do we have any? No. All right, so I'm just going to sit here and talk to them right over here. So if you give me just a moment. And, uh, and what I wanted to talk to the kids about this morning is to give some thought as to what it means to be a Christian. Like, for example, this weekend, uh, we celebrated the 4th of July, and we had to celebrate it a little bit differently but there were still, I saw fireworks going off around town, and I could hear it booming around a little bit. Um, but wherever you are, you think about the 4th of July, and we wear red, white, and blue, and all that, and you think about what it means to be an American, which means that you're, maybe you're born here, or if you came here from another place, that you become a citizen, and you, 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 you embrace that, and you, you take on what it means uh, to be an American, right? And so with all of that, uh, we've got all of that uh, you know, kind of becoming part of who we are. And this is just kind of, we are the people that live here and this is how we live. But there are certain ideas that go along with that too. And on the day of independence, we talk about life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And that those are rights that people have that doesn't matter uh, if, if uh, we were to change governments or change anything, those rights belong to everybody. And so we think about that. And that's those ideals that kind of form who we are as a nation. And as Christians, uh, there's a lot of things we could think about. We could think about there were people who go to church or we're, there were people who uh, think a certain way. But it's really at heart, is not even so much an ideal as it is a person. It's the person of Jesus. Jesus who we know is alive. We know that he's with us. And it, we know that he is the vision of God that helps us to know God, and that if we know him, we'll know God, and that he will bless and lead and guide us all our lives. So uh, that becomes a thing we learn about, just the same way that you learn about everything else in your life. You're learning how to, to, to do math. You're learning how to, to, to write. You're learning how to spell. You're, you know, you're learning all these things, and you'll learn things about Jesus as you go. But at the core... It's really about just that relationship with him. So remember that. No matter where you go or what you're doing, uh, whatever else is going on in the world, whatever is going on in your life, focus on that. Always paying attention to that relationship in your prayers, in your studies, in the ways that you treat other people, in the, in the, in the things that you choose to do and in the things that you choose not to do. Always start with that core issue of sticking with him following where he leads, okay? So let's pray about that. And I ask the congregation to please help me. So repeat after me. Dear God, we thank you so much for giving us Jesus and showing us the way to follow him and be with you forever. And we pray, dear God, that you would always guide us and always lead us to know him and to know you. Amen. All right. All right. So uh, today's a special day. You might notice things are a little bit different. We are in the season after Pentecost, which is a green season. And yet Deacon John and I are wearing white stoles and the altar is dressed in white and we've got a baptismal font here now a word about that this is a brand new baptismal font it is a gift from Katie Jukic in memory of her parents and uh, it's so new we don't even have the the, the plate saying all that on, on the bottom of it yet um, but this will be the first baptism that we're going to use it for today and we are here to celebrate the baptism of Lorraine Floyd and she's out here, she's uh, moseying around with daddy, and that's okay. Um, she is a beautiful girl, as you will see momentarily, if you haven't already. Here she comes. 
right on time. And, um, and she's got this wonderful, loving family around her to support her. And she's going to take over the whole moment, yes. Because <laughs> that is what she does, right? And that is the gift of new life. And, and here's the thing. Uh, one of the things that Meg and I learned as parents, as young parents especially, and this is something our doctor actually told us, a pediatrician or obstetrician told us, said that, uh, that infants are never wrong for the first three months of their lives. Why are they never wrong? Well, there's, they've basically got three things on their mind, and they know that they're either awake and happy and energetic, or they're tired and need to go to sleep. They know if they're clean, and they know if they need to be changed, and they know if they're full or if they need to be fed, right? And so they know one way or the other those three things, and that's what they're focused on, and if any of those is out of order, they will let you know. Now, of course, their worlds change very quickly. Lorraine is almost a year old, and her perception of the world is changing dramatically day by day. We were supposed to do this baptism on Mother's Day, and we had to, of course, delay because of the, the COVID. Um, but so even in these couple of months since then, she's changed dramatically. And uh, one of the big changes, even just this week, as I understand it, she met her cousins for the first time this week, right? Or at least that she would remember. And, and, and her cousins are about a year maybe older than her, roughly. And so, and it's really her first exposure to other small children. So it's like, oh, there are people closer to my size. That's a whole new thing for her. And, um, and that, you know, as she's in this, this stage, and she's, she's just started walking, and she can mow around really well. And she's also learning to talk right now. And it, it makes me think about uh, the ways that we talk to babies. You know, we try to get them to use language to engage one another. And I think about all the things that we say uh, to them. Like, mommy loves you. Daddy loves you. Right now, grandma is loving you. And great grandma, too. Or when you try to get them to sleep, you sing them a little lullaby. You know, rock a baby. And then there's my, my personal favorite. Ignorance of the law is no excuse. <laughs> now let's just think about this for a moment. Let's say that Lorraine decides at some point that she is going to be a lawyer. Now if she's going to be a lawyer, what does she have to do? Well, she's got to be a good student right from the start. So that even starts right now. You know, all the language that she's learning now, that's going to matter. And, uh, and as she goes through school, if she does well at that, then, then she'll go to college. And she'll do college for four years. And if she does well enough in college, then she'd go to law school for three more years. And maybe have some summer internships in the middle of that so she gets some practical experience. And then if she does all that well, then she'd have to pass the bar exam. And if she passes that, then she can be licensed. And then once she's gone through all that training, all that education, and all that license process, then what do we have? She would be a very green and inexperienced young attorney. And at that point, it's not like she's gotten up to the plateau. It's like she's just struggled up the first step. And from that point forward, she'll keep learning and growing and, and learning how to to. to, to learn the law, and then how to apply the law, how to argue the law. It becomes more art than anything, and there's literally no end of it. I mean, think of all the federal and the state and the local laws and ordinances, and then in every industry, there's a never-ending uh, realm of, of regulation and rules, and, and all of those laws and regulations and rules are changing all the time. And they're changing either by new legislation or they get changed by precedent set in court. So there's no end to it. It's tough. It's challenging. It's endlessly thick and complex. And all of that is true for the lawyers. What about the rest of us? I mean, if Lorraine becomes a teacher or a doctor or a 
uh, she opens her own business, you know, she, she goes into farming, you know, whatever she's going to do, whatever she does. If she runs into the law, I mean, whether she's done something wrong or whether she's buying a house, if she runs into the law, when she runs into the law, for whatever reasons, it's impossible for the rest of us to manage it. We're going to look for a lawyer. And in fact, we're going to look for the best lawyer we can find or that we can afford. Now that's tough then, living under the law. And applying the law to our lives is complex. In today's passage from Romans, Paul reminds us that that application is hard. In fact, it's even hard to read what Paul said. Rusty, you did a great job. Uh, you know, the, the things I, I would do, I don't do, and I do do what I don't do, and I didn't should do, and I don't do, and I, I call that the shooby dooby doo passage uh, from Romans. And so what happens is that even when we're trying to apply the simple core foundations, foundational precepts of our faith to the incidents and accidents of each of our lives, we face an unending complexity in how our faith must be lived. Now, in Jesus' time, he's dealing with, we can divide him kind of into two groups of people that he's contending with. One group are those who are very well steeped in the law, the the, the Pharisees and the scribes and the lawyers of his own time. And, and so they're, they're very steeped in it. They're learning it, they're, and, they, and they're, they're the leaders of it and everything. And, and they get it, and they are very rigid about it. And then there's the rest of the people who don't have the time, don't have the, the resources, don't have the luxury of, of delving into that all the time. And they're feeling completely left out. And so they're issues and dealing with the complexities of life and trying to understand this law are just as tough as they are for us. And that complexity can rest in everything from the ways we decide to worship to the ways that we decide to act or to not act in every situation. Life is infinitely complex and we are always torn between our natural instincts and staying yoked to Christ within ourselves. And that's just for us as individuals. The complexity gets exponentially more difficult as we apply it in our families and in our communities. So imagine just for a moment, if you stood accused, and if guilty, you would be condemned. And that's if you were earnestly trying to do your best, which we mostly do, or at least we think we do, but not always. And so we stand convicted. Jesus said, Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Now, a yoke is something that you would put on a beast of burden, like an ox. And, um, and that's it's kind of a tough analogy for us, because who uses an ox anymore? I mean, I've got Dr. Jukic right here. Doc, do you have a lot of oxes out there that, that are pulling plows anymore? No. Uh, that's, so it's kind of a distant analogy. Um, but here's the thing about, about if... if you know, if you've got to pull a plow through a field, a big, strong ox is a great thing to do it. And if you were yoked to an ox, then there are two things that are going to be true. One is that you're not going to be doing much of the pulling, right? The, the ox is going to do all the heavy pulling. But it's also true that wherever that ox is going, you're going with him, right? And that yoke is actually why uh, I'm wearing a stole and why Deacon John's wearing a stole. The stole is actually meant to replicate or remind us of that yoke, that we're yoked to Christ. And so wherever he goes, I got to go with him. That's the hope anyway. And I look at Lorraine, Rainy as her family calls her. This is a child with infinite potential. 
she could indeed become a lawyer. She could become anything. And because she's got great parents, great grandparents, and great great grandparents, and this family around her, uh, they're going to support her in all of it. They're going to raise her to meet her potential. They'll support and encourage her education. They're going to teach her to swim and learn how to ride a bike. They'll put her in various sports as she grows up. If her grandmother has anything to do about it, she's going to learn how to water ski. Have you already put her on the skis? No, not yet. I would imagine she'll probably wind up learning some instrument. Maybe she'll go to dance. You know, there'll be all sorts of things that she's going to do. Maybe she'll learn a different language along the way. There's infinite potential in this child. And she has a journey that none of us can predict. Who knows what she will do? Because with her infinite potential, there's also infinite directions. And who knows whom she's going to meet along the way? Who knows what global events are going to shake her world in, in the next 50 years? Who knows? Did any of us know six months ago where we'd be today? No. Life is an adventure. And so in the midst of all that adventure, what we think about God is important. And it's important, remember, we don't make this up from scratch. Our faith has been handed down to us across centuries, and it's been interpreted across those centuries. The scriptures that we read just this morning range from about 2,000 to 2,500 years old. The collect that we prayed at the start of the service is about 1,500 years old. It's from the oldest liturgy that we have. So everything that we pray and read and sing carries that great wealth of theological, moral, and ethical discourse in the church across all this time. And yet today, and this has been true, this is not new, it's been in every age, there is a very persistent, loud, and strident movement to tear us away from our roots. And it's everywhere. It crosses social and political lines, and it's instantly available. Now, most of us think about the instantly being available as being on our phones today, right? But for a lot of you, you've now got it on your watch. And you remember a couple of years ago, Google tried putting it on glasses so you could just see it wherever you went, a heads-up display. And I'm not kidding about this. Before long, they're going to try to convince you to let them put a chip in you. That's not a joke. And uh, the chip would maybe help you translate languages immediately. Might help monitor your health. There's a lot of things the chip could do. It could keep track of where you are. Okay? Now, if that happens, and even what is happening, who at Google or Microsoft or Apple is controlling all of that? And in what direction do they lead? Are they going to lead you to God or to their bank accounts? It's like they've got the hand just putting it in there to pick your pocket all the time. And so one of the things that we're proclaiming this morning as we step into this baptism is we're saying very loudly and clearly, not Lorraine, not any of the children we serve, not any of the adults that we serve, not anyone that we can reach. We are helping anyone we can to know Jesus and through him to know his Father. Jesus said, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and understanding and revealed them to little children. Yes, Father, for such was your gracious will. He's not specifically referring to children, probably including children, but, but he's referring to the common people, the people who don't have the time or training to become experts in theology. 
I mean, sure, we need preachers and teachers and books and hymns and songs to help us to grow in faith. And our faith does seek understanding. And so our studies are important. But the relationship is the key. And that relationship is directly between each of us and him. And it's between all of us and him. You know, I found it very interesting that uh, one of the things that's happened during this pandemic is that Pope Francis, who's the head of the Catholic Church, and let me tell you, the Catholic Church's theology is that the church mediates grace between God and people. And the Pope himself said, you don't need someone to mediate between you and God, with which I heartily agree. He comes down to each of us in him. And here's the thing. Once we really come to know him, it inoculates us. And we're all looking for a vaccine, right, to keep the COVID off us, right? Well, knowing Christ inoculates us from the myriad of falsehoods that the world throws at us every day. Knowing him inoculates us from being crushed by the chances and challenges of this life. Knowing him inoculates us from being crushed by the weight of our own sin. Those things that we don't do that we should and the things that we do do that we should not. Knowing Jesus delivers us from evil of all kinds. And that is the power of grace. That is the joy of being in his yoke. And so we come back again and again and again to his grace. And even in the midst of all the challenges and the frustrations and the difficulties and the, and the agonies that this life throws at us, we find that his yoke is easy and his burden is light. Because whatever we're doing, he's doing the heavy pull. And so, yes, we stand convicted and we stand redeemed. And for all eternity, the one thing that Lorraine needs most in this life, this life, what she needs most is this life-giving and life-shaping relationship with Jesus Christ. And what a joy it is that we're bringing her into this fellowship. Now, in a sense, that is Church of the Good Shepherd because she's here. But they live in Tampa. You know, they're, they're extended family for the, for the Church of the Good Shepherd. But we're bringing her not just into th this church or even into the Episcopal Church. We're bringing her into the body of Christ. We're bringing her into his fellowship and into his household, the household of God. That's our task this morning. And like everything else that we're going to be teaching her her whole life, she will eventually take this relationship on for herself. Her, her parents and godparents will take on uh, promises. But just the same way they feed her now, she's learning to feed herself. They used to walk her around. She's learning to walk. They speak for her. She'll learn to speak of her own mind. And she will come to own this relationship as well. Just as she will every responsibility in her life. And the joy of this moment when I really think about it is that, you know, the game plan here is, is that she'll grow up and she will have a sense that she's always known him. That he's always been a part of her life. And however that plays out, we trust that he knows her and that no matter what else life may throw at her, he's got her. He's got her forever. And that is a beautiful thing. And for us to remember that he's got us forever as well.
And so there's really nothing left to say except let's do this. Amen.